I'm Alan Goldberg, and I want to double on Rob McKinney's welcome to everybody to this AHSP and to our first talk of the, of the weekend. Uh, Bob Naya is our featured speaker tonight. He is a freelance writer at this point. He's former editor of Sky and Telescope. He's uh, been kind enough to come to AHSP several years, many years. Yeah, this is uh, 2006. Yeah. That quantifies, that qualifies for many years. I'm an old timer. <laughs> um, and he always has something different to bring to us. And he's very good at putting some of the complicated facts of, of scientific astronomy in context for us as amateurs. So I want to welcome Bob and he can take it away. Um, we're going to be here about an hour, an hour and a half with questions, whatever you yep. like. And we should be done in plenty of time for people to get back to their telescopes. Wait, this is my four hour talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and people after they observe can come back in. <laughs> okay, well thank you very much for the introduction. Is everybody, kind of, well, I'll let them get seated there. Um, so a few months ago, Catherine Scott was very generous and emailed me uh, and said, you know, we'd love to have you and Rod, Rod and Melise back, and I hope you can all go to Rod's talk tomorrow night. Um, and so I had to come up with a topic. Well, because this is, I think this is my sixth or seventh year at, at AHSP, most of my topics have been exhausted. So I didn't, you know, I didn't want to give the same talk. Fortunately, I had one talk, which I don't recall, having given here before. And if any of you remember me giving a talk about the Hubble Space Telescope at AHSP, then I apologize. I've given this talk to other clubs, but I don't, I don't recall ever giving it here, and Catherine didn't remember it either. So it turns out, though, the timing is really, really good because we're, we're celebrating the 25, 25th year of the Hubble Space Telescope in orbit. So I thought now would be a really good time to kind of summarize some of its greatest contributions to astronomy. Now, of course, if I tried to list every one, then we'd, you know, we'd be here all weekend long. So I'm just trying to hit some of the highlights, uh, some of the, the discoveries and contributions that I think have been the most important. Of course, if you were to talk to astronomers in different fields, they would have a different list than, than I do. But what I've tried to do is, is uh, first of all, update the talk, including some very recent results but include everything from the solar system all the way to cosmology. And I want to just, first of all, before getting into the meat of the talk, I just want to thank uh, Novak, who every year does a spectacular job of organizing this star party, uh, the Mountain Institute, for letting us come here year after year after year. And for some reason, they haven't kicked us out yet. And I especially want to thank all the people, you know, who are wearing the red lanyards in the club and you know, who do such a great job of organizing this star party year after. It's one reason I keep coming back, because every time I have a great time here. I've even had great times here during some of the star parties where we haven't even had good weather. I still have a very good time just meeting people, talking astronomy, and talking the breeze. And of course, I want to thank all of you for coming, and hopefully we'll have some clear skies. Okay, I think uh, everyone in Novak is already aware of this. For those of you who are not members of NOVAC or who never knew Phil. Uh, Phil was one of the leading guiding lights of this star party all the way back from the very beginning. And he passed away, I think it was about five months ago now, uh, of, of I believe it was heart failure, is that correct? Uh, and it's really sad. I got to know Phil not only here at the star party over a number of years, and I remember seeing him last year, um, a few years ago, in 2012, Sky and Telescope, we had an eclipse cruise in the Coral Sea off the coast of um, Australia, and Phil and his wife Holly were on this cruise, and it was very generous. They had a birthday that uh, one of the nights, and they invited me to join them at one of the you know, premium restaurants on our giant cruise ship, and it was really nice having dinner with her. I got to know Holly a little bit. And I feel really guilty because I don't remember now whether it was Phil's birthday or Holly's birthday. But it was one of, you can see here, happy birthday. But it was really good to get to know Phil kind of outside of the star party uh, and also to get to know his wife too. 
and obviously, I mean, this was a tremendous loss for the club, uh, for me personally, for a lot of people in this room personally, knowing, knowing Phil. Um, but, you know, at least we know that while he was alive, you know, he really accomplished a lot, both in his career, but also in amateur astronomy and outreach and being one of the leading lights of, uh, of this star party. So I am dedicating uh, this talk to Phil and his memory. Uh, so now getting on to, to Hubble. Now Hubble to the public is really famous for pretty pictures. And I'm just showing you here some of its famous iconic images. Um, you know, it's everything like this is a planetary nebula. This is a galaxy, uh, you know, polar, or, or the, uh, polar ring galaxy. This is a globular cluster. So Hubble's, you know, taking beautiful pictures of objects from inside our solar system all the way out to the farthest distance, uh, distances in the visible universe. Probably its most famous picture, and I was working at Astronomy Magazine back in 1996 when this Pillars of Creation of uh, the Eagle Nebula came out. And of course, this was like jaw-dropping. Well, the astrophysicist who actually took this picture with Hubble is Jeff Hester of Arizona State University, whose main interest is star formation. And really, he took this picture for scientific reasons, not really, I don't think even he fully anticipated what an incredible image this would be. Uh, he tells me his wife is always wondering, well, how come we don't get money for this? Because this, of course, is always a, you know, is on t-shirts, posters, coffee mugs. Um, you can also see here, there's like a kitty cat here. And also some people claim this is the devil. And then there's other people who claim that they can see Elvis in this picture, <laughs> but, I, but I haven't seen Elvis. Well, Je Jeff told me another funny story since we're at a star party, that one year he was at a star party and during, he was speaking that night. And during the day he was walking in the field and checking out all the amateur telescopes. And he got to this one amateur scope and the amateur was like, didn't even know who he was and started going, oh, you know, I've got this telescope and these eyepieces and this CCD, and just went on and on about how great his telescope was. And then he asked Jeff, well, what telescope do you use? <laughs> and Jeff goes, I use the Hubble Space Telescope. <laughs> um, so just a reminder, probably some of you know this already, is this is the telescope before it launched. It's roughly the size of a, of, of a city bus, uh, weighs 12 tons, and its primary mirror is eight feet across. Now that, from an amateur point of view, that's really, really big, you know, compared to like the big 10 meter behemoths, you know, on Mauna Kea and elsewhere in the world, it's actually not a really big telescope by modern standards for professional standards. If you're wondering, uh, since we're near DC and we've got the Northern Virginia Club, we're kind of, a lot of people here work for the government or think, you know, in terms of government and politics, uh, it's cost about $13 billion uh, from the beginning of the program in the 1980s up till about now. I should point out that the Europeans have foot some of that bill because it's a joint project with the European Space Agency, but it's mostly funded by American taxpayers. So if you average it out over about 40 years and a couple hundred million people you know, paying taxes to the federal government, it works out, actually it's a little bit less than a dollar per year that, that all of you in this room who pay taxes have been funding the telescope. And I do hope by the end of this talk, if you're not convinced already, that you feel like you've gotten your money's worth. Of course, the telescope is named after Edwin Hubble. You can see his birth and death dates here. Uh, most astronomers are happy if they make one great discovery in their life. He actually made two. Uh, in 1923, he published a paper studying Cepheid variable stars in the Andromeda galaxy that proved beyond doubt that the Andromeda galaxy was way beyond the confines of our Milky Way galaxy. That proved that we live in a universe with enormous numbers of galaxies. The evidence actually was very strong before that, but it was his paper that really convinced the entire professional community. Well, that, was, that alone would have sealed his name as one of the greatest astronomers of all time. But six years later, working with Milton Humason, he made a second great discovery. He showed that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving away from us. 
And that was the very, very powerful uh, evidence for the expanding universe. And that really is, you know, was the pillar observation that led to our modern understanding of cosmology. So for either of those discoveries, he would be, you know, his name would go down forever. And he actually made two great discoveries. So I think it's very appropriate to name the Space Telescope after him. Uh, this shows the launch photo uh, back when we were still flying. Space shuttle missions, uh, Discovery, April 24th, 1990. The next day, using the uh, robotic arm built in Canada, uh, they deployed the Space Telescope into orbit. And it, the orbit's changed a little bit over time, but it's generally orbiting about 350 miles above sea level. It's going at about 17,000 miles per hour. That's pretty fast. Uh, it, even the, the cops in Wardensville, West Virginia, wouldn't be able to catch it. Um, it orbits Earth every 95 minutes. And raise your hands if you've seen it with your naked eye, because it's pretty easy to see if you know it's going overhead. I should have checked uh, to see if it was passing over tonight. I just, didn't, I just forgot. But uh, if somebody wants to check, we might be able to even see it tonight or tomorrow night. Now, especially the, uh, you know, some of the folks who follow it might remember that shortly after it was launched and they've started to get the first pictures down, we're talking PR disaster. They had ground the mirror to the wrong formula. Okay? They actually got the hard part right and the easy part wrong. The easy part is, is like you know, getting prescription glasses to have it you know, shaped to the right curvature. That's what they got wrong. It was only off by about a 50th the width of a, of a human hair, but that was enough to seriously blur the images. The hard part was making it so smooth that if you, you spread the mirror out to the size of the United States, the tallest mount would only be a few inches high. That's the really hard thing to do. They actually got that right. So they got the easy thing wrong and the hard part right. Fortunately, and oh, you might remember these were, these were, this was a cartoon that came out uh, after, after the public learned what was going on. Yeah. Now, this one actually came out much later, but there were, there were uh, this, this was kind of typical, too, of some of the, uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, cartoons that were coming out. Um, so fortunately, and this will not be true of Hubble's successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, Hubble was specifically built to be serviced by space shuttle astronauts, and it was put in low Earth orbit where, where the space shuttle can access it. So the, the good news is they, the astronomers figured out what was wrong with the telescope. They figured, out, they figured it all out, and they were able to figure out a correction by installing this instrument called COSTAR, and I can't remember what that stands for. It's one of those horrible NASA acronyms. Uh, but it essentially is like wearing a pair of glasses that fixed the, the incorrect curvature. So it, uh, the, the servicing mission, the first one, was December 2nd through 13th, 1993. And these are the uh, four astronauts who, uh, who serviced it, very brave and incredibly competent people. I've actually had the honor to meet two of them. I've met... Uh, Jeffrey Hoffman and Story, Story Musgrave. In fact, Jeffrey Hoffman right now is a professor of engineering at MIT, just a few miles from uh, the Sky and Telescope offices. And of course, when they do these, they also look through the telescope at the other end to look down at Earth. No, actually, they don't. Uh, so you can see here the, the huge difference. This is a star. You can see how to, out of focus it is here, and then after the corrective optics, and then this is the center of the spiral galaxy M100. And you can see what a huge difference. And basically, with this uh, fix, uh, it brought Hubble up to specification. Uh, and I just want to mention, I, I'm really going to talk mostly about the science. But overall now, there have been five servicing missions. Uh, you've got the first, second, a 3A, 3B, and 4. And you can see how its, it's uh, instruments and cameras have been totally changed since it launched in 1990. So what's really amazing is over a lot of like things get worse over time you know, that humans build. This is a case where the telescope is now 100 times more powerful 
than it was after the first servicing mission because these new cameras are you know, much more sensitive and better and like in every conceivable way, Hubble's been able to take advantage of upgrades in technology over time because it's serviceable. So I just want to go through a couple uh, track records of accomplishments. It's completed nearly 140,000 orbits. It's observed more than 32,000 unique targets for a total of more than 1 million observations, 55 plus terabytes of data, which would fill over 10,000 DVDs. Uh, this is really amazing. It's contributed to more than 10,000 published research papers that they themselves then have generated more than 400,000 citations. Uh, the Image Gallery website receives 100 million hits per month, one of the most popular NASA websites, um, and achieves, because it's in outer space, it's not looking through the atmosphere, it uh, achieves a resolution of 0 .08 arc seconds. How we would love to have that here on the mountaintop. And of course, it's by far the most famous telescope ever built. If you just walk down the street of Washington, D.C., or just a town or wherever, and ask people to name a telescope, very good chance they're going to say the Hubble Space Telescope or Hubble Telescope. So now I'm going to talk about some of its uh, accomplishments. I'll start with a solar system, then I'll kind of venture out into our galaxy. And then at the end of my talk, I'll talk about its contributions with uh, uh, extragalactic astronomy and cosmology. Uh, one of the first things it did after the, the servicing mission is it started, uh, because there's so much ambient light, this, this, it kind of looks like, this almost doesn't even look like Mars. If it was darker in here, believe me, this would look like Mars, more reddish. Um, but it, there was a mission en route to Mars and the planners and scientists on the mission wanted to know what the conditions would be like on Mars when their spacecraft got there. So Hubble actually was used to observe Mars uh, prior to the landing. Uh, this was Mars Pathfinder, which landed on July 4th, a very fitting day, 1997. So they were able to look at the exact landing spot and could see that for the most part it was relatively clear. There weren't any major dust storms which could have really interfered with the landing. This of course is an automated landing sequence. This was an airbag landing with parachutes. And then a couple days after it landed, then we, you know, we got a good look at uh, that area of Mars again from Hubble. So astronomers could kind of correlate what they're seeing on the ground from the spacecraft with what Mars looks like from, uh, you know, from a distance. And you might remember, this was this mission called Mars Pathfinder, uh, a low, relatively low cost mission that deployed a small rover called Sojourner. And this was a highly successful mission. Uh, the lander operated for several months, uh, which was much longer than was expected. And the rover uh, uh, operated for about a month and it was the success of this very small rover about the size of this green bin right here that proved to uh, the, you know, the scientific community and most of all Congress that it is possible to operate a rover on the surface of Mars. The Soviets had earlier proved that it was possible to operate a rover on the moon but it's much more challenging doing it on Mars. It's much farther away. The signal takes much longer to get to and from Mars. They prove that you can land a rover on Mars and get it to work exactly as planned. So it was this mission that paved the way for Spirit and Opportunity that landed in 2004, and then much more recently, the Curiosity lander. Okay, another thing that uh, Hubble did, and I'm sure many of uh, you remember this, is in July 1994, we had one of the most dramatic uh, uh, astronomy events of our lifetime was Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 impacted Jupiter. Uh, it, was a string, it, was, it had originally been one comet, but the comet came too close to Jupiter, and Jupiter's gravity, due to the tidal force, basically ripped the comet apart into 21 fragments known as a string of pearls. Well, in July 1994, over the course of several days, these fragments crashed into Jupiter as it was rotating, 
and Hubble got really incredible, beautiful images of the bruise marks left behind on Jupiter um, as, from these uh, impacts. And here's just an example of some of these bruise marks. Now, you could, you could see these through an amateur telescope. How many of you saw these bruise marks uh, in, back in 1994? It was really an incredible, incredible thing to see. I mean, Jupiter had never looked like that before. So with Hubble, we got really great pictures. They did spectroscopy. What was happening is that this material from deeper down in Jupiter was being dredged up by the violence of the impact. But then over time, these high-speed winds in Jupiter's atmosphere eventually, over a few weeks or months, erased these impact spots. And here you can see some really good pictures from Hubble showing the evolution of, of this one spot. And by the way, this spot here is about the size of Earth. So this gives you an idea of what would happen if like a comet about a mile wide smashed into Earth. It would not be a very good day or the period after that. Uh, and just so all of you know, it's not just uh, Hubble that sees this. There's an amateur uh, ast astronomer in Australia named Anthony Wesley. He actually saw uh, this dark spot in, um, in an image he took in July 2009 realized it was an impact spot. So then the next, I guess it was one or two days later, Hubble then went and uh, trained its eye on this impact spot and got a really, really great picture. This was a much smaller fragment, by the way, than the Shoemaker line fragments. I think the, ob the object that created this spot was maybe a few, what was it, a few tens or hundreds of meters across, you know, much less than a mile wide. And something recently, that I think was really cool is that Hubble images and spectroscopy, this is like uh, just contours. This isn't like a picture, like a real picture, but spectroscopy of the uh, environment around the moon of Jupiter called Europa found evidence. It's, not, it's actually somewhat under dispute uh, because it hasn't been replicated since, but the Hubble observations show that Europa seems to be venting water vapor into space. Uh, and we know for pretty, I'd say it's pretty much confirmed, we do know that there's a liquid water ocean beneath the icy crust of Europa. Well, maybe there's a few weak spots in the crust where occasionally, maybe sporadically, Europa is venting a water vapor into space. Uh, next out is Saturn, the ring planet. Uh, this is, an once again, the colors are a little bit off because we have so much ambient light in here. Uh, this is really an incredibly beautiful picture of Saturn. Um, this is amazing, and this, I think this is the, the uh, moon Tethys. The thing I love about this picture, see this black thin line? That's the shadow of Tethys being cast on the rings. Really an exquisite image. Um, Using Hubble, this is an infrared picture taken with the NICMOS camera. By, you, by looking at uh, Saturn in the infrared, you can look down to much deeper layers than what you see in visible light, where the visible light from Saturn, you're basically seeing the upper haze layer. Here we're seeing much deeper down, you see a much more pronounced banded structure. We see a couple storm systems and we get a much better sense of what the atmosphere is like beneath this haze layer by uh, using Hubble's infrared camera and its high resolution. Uh, these are a fairly recent discovery. This is the planet Uranus, which, remember, has been knocked over on its side. It orbits kind of like a bowling ball as it orbits the sun rather than spinning like a top. So its poles are actually, these are the poles, and these are aurora, uh, and these, by the way, are the thin rings of Uranus, very thin rings. Um, this is actually an aurora on Uranus that was discovered by the Hubble Space Telescope from these images. Uh, this is interesting, too, moving one planet further out with Neptune. Uh, in August 1989, the Voyager 2 spacecraft flew by Neptune, and one of its great discoveries is that Neptune had a very large dark spot roughly the size of Earth. So then the question is, is this a long-lived storm like the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, which has been around for hundreds of years, 
or is it kind of a temporary phenomenon? Well, with Hubble, which with its uh, repaired, uh, repaired optics, uh, look, took a look in 1994, just five years later, well, the dark spot was gone. Hubble had the capability to see it, okay, but it did not see it, which tells us that the storm disappeared. So in all likelihood, this great dark spot on Neptune was a temporary phenomenon. We don't know when it started, but it certainly didn't last five years after we first saw it, where with a great red spot, we know it's been raging for hundreds of years. Okay, now of course, Pluto's big time in the news. Uh, the best pictures we had of Pluto prior to the arrival of New Horizon came from Hubble. These are three different Hubble photos showing the different hemispheres, the different faces. So they knew even before New Horizons got there that, that Pluto had a very highly varied surface with different colors at, on different parts of the surface. <clears throat> so that told us, you know, it's going to be a pretty interesting world. I personally consider Pluto a planet, but I know that's a matter of opinion. Uh, but the other thing that Hubble did, very significant discovery, is Hubble discovered that we already knew uh, from the uh, late 70s there, that Pluto had a fairly large moon called Charon, but Hubble, on different observations, discovered four more moons, Styx, Nix, Hydra, and Kerberos. So that gave New Horizons um, basically six targets to shoot at. You have Pluto, Charon, and these four smaller moons. Uh, it's thought the leading theory for these moons is that sometime a long time ago, Pluto got whacked by a fairly large object and all this debris was, was you know, scattered into Pluto orbit, which then coalesced gravitationally into these moons. I think we're gonna find out eventually when we get all the data back from New Horizons and the scientists have a chance to analyze it, we will then find out if that, in fact, if that in, is in fact true. Uh, Hubble also discovered that the object that kind of knocked Pluto down from planet status, which is Eris, here also has a moon called, uh, now called Dysnomia, and this was also a Hubble discovery. And I just want to show a quick picture here. This is, you know, the really great New Horizons photo of Pluto, and this is uh, called Tombaugh Regio, and you can kind of match this up with the Hubble pictures. I'm not sure, okay, and I would need to have one of the scientists here. I think this picture, I would think, correlates with this Hubble picture so that here we're looking at Tombaugh Regio, this lighter area. Is there, any, is there anybody here who knows whether that is in fact true or not? Okay. That is it. Okay. So in other words, we were seeing this Tombaugh Regio, this very dramatic feature from the Hubble images. And you can also see this dark band uh, in the southern hemisphere. And you can definitely, you know, see hints of that in the, in the Hubble images. So definitely the New Horizons is better. It tells you the value of sending a spacecraft to visit a place up close. But considering this is from Earth orbit, I'd say Hubble did pretty well. And the other thing too is Hubble has found three potential Kuiper Belt objects that uh, could be targets for New Horizons because New Horizons is sailed by Pluto, the Pluto system, but they're hoping to have it come kind of near another Kuiper Belt object as it leaves the solar system. And through the, uh, Hubble has found three possible objects uh, for future uh, exploration from New Horizons. Okay, now I'm going to venture out into the Milky Way galaxy talking about the lives of stars. Uh, I wrote a book in the late 1990s called Through the Eyes of Hubble uh, when I was working at Astronomy Magazine, and the wife of my best friend from high school, who's a graphic illustrator, produced some really nice uh, graphics for this book. Um, so we think stars form from these uh, big clouds of gas and dust, that break apart into clumps, and then gravitationally these clumps start to collapse. As they uh, collapse inward, the clouds start to spin. Most of the mass ends up at the center, and that becomes the star. 
for a brief period, you get jets from magnetic fields in the disk are kind of whisk material away and funnel that into jets, but eventually you settle down into a quieter disk. This is where the planets end up forming, and eventually the disks dissipate as the material either gets you know, into planets or as in asteroids or comets that get ejected from the system. So this was the theory that existed prior to the launch of Hubble. Uh, so Hubble's been able to really put the theory to the test, and actually the theory is actually done pretty well. Uh, this is a ground-based image of the Orion Nebula uh, from Robert Gendler, a tremendous astrophotographer who's also a radiologist who lives in Connecticut and a friend of mine. Um, this is now a Hubble mosaic of the inner region of the uh, Orion Nebula. This is actually several hundred individual images stitched together on a computer to form this mosaic. And this picture is actually relatively close, not exactly, but relatively close to, quote, true color, or color is like the typical human eye would see it. Uh, one of the things then that Hubble, they were looking for and they found when they looked at these pictures in detail is a lot of these young stars are surrounded by disks. And this is really, I think, a very profound picture because it basically really showed that our theory is essentially correct. So these are five different disks uh, surrounding the young stars. This is one seen almost edge on, and you can see these disks at different angles. Uh, so this really you know, supports the picture that was, had developed even before Hubble. And Hubble has also taken some of the really best images of these jets that shoot out from these young stars. Some of these jets are like several tens of light years long. So these are immense structures that, you know, if the sun was shooting a jet out, it's, you know, it's not doing it now, but it may have done it in its youth the jet would have gone way past the distance of the nearest stars. This is a particularly dramatic one because you can see the disk edge on uh, and you can see the jet shooting out uh, perpendicular to the disk just as theory predicted. Uh, these, you know, they've even been able to see in time sequences they can clock the speed of the material in these jets and it's moving at like tens or hundreds of thousands of miles an hour. This is a really interesting jet. This, the uh, actual star is embedded in this cloud, but the jet, you can kind of see it looks like it's twirling. They think this is probably a binary star where the star is uh, being uh, perturbed by its binary companion, and that's caused the jet to precess, creating kind of this corkscrew pattern. Uh, now, this is another disk, but this is a much older disk this is what's known as a debris disk, kind of like our Kuiper belt when the planets have already formed and you only have like debris like asteroids and Kuiper belt objects left. This is a star that's many tens of millions of years old. And uh, Hubble took this beautiful image of uh, this debris disk around the star Fomalhaut, which of course is one of the closest stars to the sun only about 25 light years away. It's also a first magnitude star. Well, they noticed that there was this bright dot on the interior, kind of on the inside edge of this disk, and they noticed from 2004 to 2006 that it moved, and it moved at right about the, the amount that you would expect if, uh, for its distance from Fomalhaut if it was an orbiting planet. And of course, a lot of people think that this, eye, uh, this disc looks like the eye of Sauron from the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay, well now they've really confirmed it because they've seen it now at four different epochs. They've seen it move, and the movement is perfectly consistent with a planet. Uh, it, it, it's a little unclear. The nature of the planet's a little bit weird. Um, they think its mass is about twice that of Jupiter, uh, but it's a little too bright for that, so they think it's surrounded by kind of a cloud of dust that makes it appear brighter than it would otherwise be. And it's in a highly eccentric orbit that ranges from about 50 to 300 AU from, uh, the, from Fomalhaut. So that, you know, this would put it well beyond Pluto 
if it were in our solar system. So it's really, really far out. It seems to be this kind of, you know, two Jupiter mass planet that's fairly cold and is still surrounded by a cloud of debris. <clears throat> We've also seen debris disks around other stars with Hubble. These are just several examples. And a lot of them, interestingly, you can see they're not perfectly symmetric. They have asymmetries. And the best explanation for that is that the asymmetries are induced by the gravitation of young planets or more than one planet. Uh, another, and I think this is some of the most important work that Hubble has done, is it's made the first detections of chemicals in the atmospheres of planets orbiting other stars, what I call and what everyone's calling exoplanets. What happens is a subset of these planets, if they're perfectly aligned to our line of sight with their orbit, they cross in front of the star and Hubble can observe the star during the transit and then observe the star at a time when the planet is not transiting. Well, during the transit, some of the star's light is filtering through the upper atmosphere of the planet and causes absorption lines in the spectrum of the star. Well, those absorption lines tell you what some of these elements and molecules are in the atmosphere of the planet. So here's just an example of a hot Jupiter, a, a very close in Jupiter mass planet called HD 209458b. And the spectrum with Hubble shows that the atmosphere of this planet contains sodium, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Okay, another planet, this is more recent work. This is a planet that's only about uh, two, uh, two, two and a half times the size of Earth and only about six times the mass of Earth. So this is a planet much more like Earth than it is like Jupiter or Saturn. It might be kind of like a super Earth or a mini Neptune. Well, this uh, planet they can show from the spectrum is a water world that's enveloped by a thick, steamy atmosphere. Maybe not a great place for life because it's a very hot, fairly close into its star, but we know now that there's water vapor in the atmosphere of the star, of this planet. Okay, now I'm gonna talk briefly about the end cycle of stars rather than the birth. I think most of you know uh, low mass stars are very low luminosity. They have very long lifetimes. We've never seen the death of a truly low mass star because every star that was ever born in the universe is still alive. Well, a star that's similar to the sun will live roughly 10 billion years, and at the end of its life, it expands into a red giant, ejects its outer atmosphere to form a planetary nebula, and the core uh, is a white dwarf. The really big stars, stars like 10 to 100 times the mass of the sun, have very short lives. They burn through their nuclear fuel very fast. They expand into blue and red supergiants at the very end, and then they explode as supernovae, and they leave behind a black hole or a neutron star. Well, planetary nebula prior to Hubble, and I'm sure almost everyone in this room has seen planetary nebula in a telescope, they generally look kind of roundish, or at least you know, vaguely round. So the theory, you know, basically before Hubble, pictured these stars kind of puffing out, ejecting their outer atmospheres kind of evenly, isotropically, in all directions. Well, the Hubble pictures of these planetary nebula were real eye-openers, because when you can see them in detail, you can see very few of them are round. This one's called the Ant Nebula. Uh, these are just a collection of different uh, planetary nebula. This one's really famous. That's the ring. I bet you almost everybody in here has seen the ring. But if you look at these in detail, you'll see most of them are definitely not round or they're very complex in shape. Uh, and it turns out like even the ring nebula, now with detailed Hubble studies, especially when you can see the outer structure in these deep exposures, even the ring nebula is a much more complicated uh, object than what it might appear from looking at it at the eyepiece of an amateur telescope. Uh, and what this is telling us is that the process, there's multiple processes that are shaping these planetary nebula. They're not just ejecting their mass evenly in all directions. There's probably a lot of them are sculpted by binary companions 
or rapid rotation, or even some of them might have planets that actually the gravitation of, an, of a nearby Jupiter mass planet could actually help sculpt these complex shapes in planetary nebula. There's also this famous picture. This was on the cover of my book, uh, my Hubble book from the late 90s uh, of the mighty star Eta Carina. This is a, a, a hundred solar mass star <clears throat> that eventually is going to explode as a very powerful supernovae. Well, with Hubble, you can see the detailed shape. You can see these two lobes of gas along with a disk, an equatorial disk. Well, this star brightened dramatically in the mid-1800s by, by looking at time sequence Hubble images. You can, you can say, well, when were these balls of gas back onto the star? And it would have been right at the same time in the mid-1800s when this star brightened dramatically. So clearly there was some type of very uh, explosive event where the star ejected um, several solar masses of gas uh, and created these outwardly expanding lobes. Interestingly enough though, the star is still alive and it's kicking, it's like 90 solar masses. It's uh, 10 million times the luminosity of the sun. And uh, we also, this is a ground-based image of stellar death uh, supernova 1987A, that's the star before it exploded and after it exploded. Unfortunately, the explosion was just a few years before Hubble launched, but with Hubble, you can see the aftermath of the explosion. Now, this was taken in 1990 before the optics were repaired, but even with the bad optics, Hubble discovered a ring around the supernova, which is right here. This was a really surprising discovery. And after the, the uh, mirror was repaired, we can now see three rings. This is a three-dimensional model. You have the inner ring, which we saw earlier, and two fainter outer rings. So we think, uh, the theory is, is that this star was unstable before it went supernova and ejected this material to form these rings thousands of years before it actually exploded. And here's a really cool movie that the NASA folks created. So here we can see the light from the supernova illuminates the rings, but then the shock wave of the blast starts to plow into this inner ring and cause it to light up. So astronomers were waiting to find out when that would happen, and they first started to see evidence of the ring lighting up in 1994, and then this knot started to get brighter in 1997. And by 2000, the whole ring had been lit up from the blast wave from the supernova slamming into the ring. And that gives very interesting clues about the whole physics process of this interaction, but also the, how the shock wave and how fast it's expanding outward from the exploding star. And these are some supernova remnants imaged by Hubble. Well, the main thing Hubble's done with supernova remnants is it looks at these different pockets of gas and takes the spectra. For example, uh, the, these bluish clouds are very rich in oxygen, and these uh, reddish clouds are very rich in uh, uh, silicon and iron. So by using Hubble, we can get a sense of how the, uh, the, 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 the constituents of the star when it exploded and how those elements, including elements that give rise to life, how they get dispersed out into the galaxy. Another interesting contribution from Hubble is probably many of you have heard of very powerful explosions known as gamma ray bursts. I assume most of you have heard of gamma ray bursts. Um, so the big question for many years is, well, where do they come from? What's the origin? Well, thanks to several different satellites, we now know that most of them come from exploding stars. But then the question is, well, what kind of stars? Well, with Hubble, uh, these are galaxies that hosted gamma ray bursts where NASA's SWIFT satellite could locate where the gamma ray burst occurred. Then Hubble can go in and see exactly where in the galaxy the, uh, the gamma ray burst occurred. It turns out that the gamma ray bursts, almost all of them come from areas of very rich star formation, which tells us these are very massive stars. 
but also most of these are very primitive, low mass, what are known as dwarf galaxies, very much a lot smaller than the Milky Way and come chemically unevolved. They're very low and heavy elements like oxygen and carbon, iron, etc. So it tells us, and this is actually good news, that the types of stars that give rise to, to these gamma ray bursts, which could sterilize planets out to very large distances, the stars that give rise to gamma ray bursts, we don't have them anymore in the Milky Way galaxy. This Milky Way has been chemically enriched now for many billions of years. So these are, gal these are very different types of galaxies than the Milky Way. And that pretty, you know, there was all this hype about how, you know, gamma ray bursts, bursts of doom could like destroy Earth. Well, we don't have much to worry about because they, we, the Milky Way galaxy stopped making gamma ray bursts. Okay, so for the final part of my talk, I'm gonna venture out into the universe. Uh, this is an incredible uh, picture from Hubble of the Sombrero galaxy. Uh, M104. This is one of my favorite galaxies visually, by the way. My guess is how many of you have seen the Sombrero? Probably a lot of you. Yep. What's that? Oh, it's your screensaver. Yeah, it's really amazing. Actually, is there a wall? Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the things that Hubble has done, we know that galaxies literally collide. In fact, probably most large galaxies, including the Milky Way, have gone through collisions with other galaxies, and it's these collisions that have helped galaxies build up in size. So this is a ground-based image of a famous pair of colliding galaxies known as the antennae. I think it's NGC 4038 and 4039. Is that correct? I'm trying to remember. I should know that. Um, so with Hubble, though, you can zoom in on the central region here and really see what's going on. You can see the nucleus of each galaxy here, and you can see this massive amount of star formation and clouds. What's happening when these two galaxies are colliding, the stars are far enough apart from each other that you don't actually get stars colliding into each other. But what you do get is you get the gas clouds smashing into each other and being disrupted gravitationally so these gas clouds collapse and start forming enormous numbers of very luminous, hot, very luminous new stars. And you can really see that in this Hubble picture. Uh, this is just an uh, uh, animation of what happens when galaxies collide. This, this animation, by the way, predates these Hubble pictures. And it tells you that the astronomers had it pretty much right as to what happens. You get these interactions, then you form these long tails of, of stars, these tidal tails. And that's pretty much what you see when you look at these systems with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here are some of these young star clusters in the antennae. These are the cores of the two galaxies. Uh, they both have a supermassive black hole at the center. Eventually, those black holes are going to attract each other gravitationally. They'll lock onto each other, and eventually the black holes will merge. But that's many tens of millions of years into the future. And uh, also, we think that some of these young star clusters are about the same size and mass as globular clusters, like the ones around the Milky Way. So it could be that a lot of the Milky Way globular clusters had their origin in these co uh, galaxy collisions that would have taken place billions of years ago, long before even the sun was born. Uh, here's an incredible picture of Centaurus A uh, with Hubble. This is a ground-based picture, and here you can look at it with Hubble. And this is an interesting case where you have this elliptical galaxy, which it looks like it has cannibalized a spiral galaxy, and you see this massive dust, uh, <clears throat> which is kind of the remains of the spiral galaxy that's been cannibalized by the elliptical. Here are just some more pictures of, of these train wrecks. There's a small number of polar ring galaxies. These are galaxies where like two galaxies kind of interact with each other at an almost perfectly perpendicular angle. So you get like one galaxy is like up and down and the other is left and right. This is a really weird one. It almost looks like a duck or a bird, but this misshaped galaxy 
is the result of a collision. Uh, here's some more uh, interesting uh, galaxies that are results of collisions. This one you can see here, this warp uh, in the disk. This is another spiral that apparently merged with an elliptical. Uh, this is a, 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 with, with one of the newer cameras called the MICE. And this is the Tadpole Galaxy, where you can see this long tail is also from the result of a, of a galaxy interaction. Now this one is, these two are interesting because you look at them and these look like galaxy collisions, right? Well, actually, they're not. You would expect that we're going to have some alignments in the universe where you have two galaxies, one in the foreground, one in the background that just happen to be perfectly aligned to Earth's line of sight. Statistically, you would expect that to happen, and the answer is yes. We've seen these great pictures from Hubble where we can actually see what look like interacting galaxies, but actually in each case, one of these galaxies in the, is in the foreground, the other is in the background. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the jets that shoot out of young stars. Well, supermassive black holes shoot out jets that travel at almost the speed of light. Some of them stretch across hundreds of thousands of light years of space. One of the most famous jets shoots out from M87, which is in, in the Virgo cluster. This is a galaxy with like 100 times the mass of the Milky Way, a giant elliptical. Well, with Hubble, you can zoom in to the very central region of the galaxy and see the jet almost all the way down to its source. And, what's and this is some of the most important work that Hubble's done, is Hubble can see all the way down to the center of this galaxy, M87, and measure the speed spectroscopically of the gas in the disk orbiting the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. Well, the gas is moving at about 1.2 million miles per hour, and just based on Kepler's laws, from that velocity, you can then measure the mass of the black hole. This black hole has a mass of three and a half billion times the mass of the sun. Our galaxy's black hole is about four million solar masses, so this uh, galaxy's black hole is about a thousand times more massive. Uh, it's also helping us understand the origin of these jets from these twisting magnetic field lines uh, from the disk that's feeding the black hole, the magnetic field lines get wound up and that helps funnel the material out into these jets. Actually, I'm going to skip this and move on. This is another galaxy and another spectrum. This is M84, also in the Virgo cluster. This is a galaxy from this high speed of the gas, uh, red shifted and blue shifted, this galaxy's black hole is about 300 million solar masses. And thanks to Hubble and other telescopes, that we now know there's a very tight correlation between the mass of the galaxy and the mass of the central black hole. The larger the galaxy, like M87, these giant elliptical galaxies have black holes measured in billions of solar masses, where smaller galaxies like the Milky Way have black holes measured maybe a few million times the mass of the sun. There's even smaller galaxies like M33 have black central black holes on the order of maybe several tens or hundreds of thousands of solar masses. But this correlation tells us something very important that the evolution of the galaxy and the black hole are somehow tied together that the black hole and the galaxy are co-evolving in a way that preserves this relationship. I should point out, though, they have since found a few galaxies that are way above or below this line, where the black hole is either too big or too small what, from what you'd expect from this line. But most galaxies, the black hole is right along this diagonal line. Uh, so venturing outward into the universe, this is a Hubble picture of the Coma Cluster. Um, one of the things that Hubble was, its main objectives was to measure the Hubble constant. That's the expansion rate of the universe. Now prior to Hubble, there were two camps. There was a camp led by an astronomer. Uh, now Both of these astronomers are now deceased. One led by Alan Sandage, 
who they'd measure lots of galaxies and get a Hubble constant of 50. And then you had another group, and he was, by the way, at Caltech. There was another group of Gerard de Valcalers based at the University of Texas who kept getting a Hubble constant of 100. They kept publishing papers. They never agreed with each other. Uh, you can read a great book called Lonely Hearts of the Cosmos. These two competing groups had a big feud. They literally hated each other's guts. It, it, like The science isn't supposed to get personal, but sometimes it does. And on this particular research project, it got personal, and the, the, the two camps just didn't like each other. Um, so what Hubble has done is it's looked at these Cepheid variables in these galaxies, and Hubble, and this is exactly what I predicted, Hubble just split the difference. We now have a modern measurement that's right in the middle between Sandage and de Valcalers. It's this, the universe and the local universe is expanding at 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Um, so Hubble has also played a key role, and I think the biggest astronomy discoveries of the last 20 years have been exoplanets and the fact that the universe expansion rate is not even like a Hubble constant, it's actually accelerating. And by observing these very bright type 1a supernovae, which come from exploding white dwarfs in very different galaxies, these are all Hubble pictures showing these bright dots or these type 1a supernovae. Uh, Hubble played a key role in helping us discover that the universe's expansion rate is accelerating. Not only do we now know that it's accelerating, we can say that the transition from when it was decelerating from gravity to acceleration occurred five billion years ago. We know that the dark energy, this mysterious force or whatever it is that's causing the universe to accelerate was present at least nine billion years ago. In other words, the universe was decelerating nine billion years ago, but it was expanding faster than it would have had there not been dark energy. So we also now know, thanks to Hubble and a variety of other telescopes, that dark energy makes up 70% of the universe's energy budget. Uh, we also can say now, with a combination of other observations, the universe is 13.8 billion years old. I want to make it clear, Hubble has contributed to this understanding, but it's, this is from like other observatories, including uh, the Wilkinson microwave uh, satellite that NASA launched about 15 years ago. One thing Hubble has done that's really important is it's using a technique called weak gravitational lensing. This is an effect of Einstein's general relativity to search for dark matter where you look through a cluster of galaxies and you see a background cluster whose light gets distorted and the shapes of these galaxies get distorted by the gravity of the foreground cluster. So you can see here, this is what a distant group of galaxies would look like if there was no cluster in the foreground. And you can see there's a different shape and orientation if there's gravitational lensing. So Hubble's made this measurement. It's a very complex measurement, very, very difficult. But astronomers have now done this on several clusters. One of the more famous ones is a faraway cluster uh, almost four billion light years away called the bullet cluster in which two clusters of galaxies are combining. Well, this contour map shows you where the mass is based on these lensing studies from Hubble. This is where it gets really interesting. If you look at the dark matter is where the blue is. That's where we see mass that's not associated with the light of the galaxies, or there's much more mass there than there is from the stars in the galaxy. Well, with Chandra, the X-ray observatory, you can see where the hot gas is located, and you can see they're not, they're, they're not well mixed together. They're in different locations, which tells us that the gas and the dark matter aren't really interacting with each other. Uh, they've separated from each other, and that's actually what you would predict if the dark matter consists of these very heavy elementary particles, sometimes known as WIMPs. We don't know yet what the dark matter particles are, 
but they appear to be some kind of massive elementary particle. This is just a similar measurement from another cluster. Once again, you see the dark matter in blue, the hot gas in red, and you can see they're, they're not mixed together. Uh, Hubble now, some of its most famous observations are where you use it as a time machine where you stare at one little point in space for a long time, you build up the light, and you get basically a tunnel through time, and you start seeing these very distant high redshift galaxies that look really different from galaxies in the local universe. The first of these pictures, probably many of you remember this, was the Hubble Deep Field back in 1995. Actually, this was released in early 1996. Uh, this was a small area in Canis Major where Hubble just observed this spot for many dozens of hours to build up this extremely deep image of the universe. And we'll just show you what a tiny field this is. Really clever NASA animation. And that's the Hubble Deep Field. Okay, so these are just three uh, examples, three uh, you know, fields inside the deep field. You see everything from foreground Milky Way stars, you see moderately distant galaxies, all the way to these tiny little blips like this red blip. These are de galaxies billions of light years away. Uh, later on, a few years later, Hubble did a deep field south in the constellation Tucana. Statistically, this field is almost identical to the deep field north, which proved the idea that the universe is essentially the same in all directions. Um, then there was an ultra deep field image in 2010 with the new wide field camera three. These circle, these circled little blips here are galaxies beyond a redshift of eight. That's um, Redshift is a measurement of how much the universe has expanded since that object emitted its light. Well, when we see objects beyond redshift of eight, we're seen back 13 billion years ago, less than a billion years after the Big Bang. So we see these early galaxies are very small and irregular, but they're forming stars at an extremely rapid rate. That's a very important discovery. Uh, we did a cover story about a year ago in Sky and Telescope of a, what's known as the CANDLES program, another one of those horrible acronyms. Uh, this is a, a very large Hubble observing program of 600 hours looking at five different fields. Uh, you can see where the fields are located here. The five fields combined are getting close to the size of the full moon. And by looking at these fields, this is a 61-hour exposure of the field in Cetus. And when you start looking and seeing these very distant galaxies, we're looking at the time when the universe was forming stars at its most rapid rate. What's really interesting, you see these misshapen galaxies that are very, very clumpy. They have clumps of very large clouds that are forming stars at a very high rate somewhat analogous to the Tarantula Nebula in the Large Magellanic Cloud. They think, they don't really know yet, but they think the clumps are due to gravitational instabilities in the disks of these galaxies. Well, the clumps are migrating toward the centers of the galaxies, so when they get into the center, they're going to feed the supermassive black holes, generating very powerful jets, uh, and it's suggesting that the mergers are less important than astronomers thought a few years ago in forming this bla these black hole jets, these quasar-like activities. Um, we've seen the farthest spectroscopically confirmed galaxy, uh, thanks to Hubble observing the galaxy, and then Keck, the 10-meter telescope in Hawaii, taking a spectrum. This is a galaxy at redshift 7.7, .7 just a 670 million, million, million years after the Big Bang. You can see this is a galaxy is only 15% the size of our Milky Way, but it's forming stars at a rate 80 times that of our Milky Way. Uh, this from these Hubble studies and other studies with other telescopes, uh, we can now really get a sense of the star formation history of the universe. It started off slow, it peaked, 
about three billion years after the Big Bang at a redshift of about two, and then it's been slowly declining ever since. Uh, so you can see where we are now. The depressing thing about this diagram is that this trend should continue and the universe at some point many billions of years in the future will no longer, all of the gas available to form new stars will be used up and the universe will stop forming new stars. I find that actually kind of depressing, but the universe doesn't care what I think. Um, just a week ago, and I had to add this slide, uh, the Keck Observatory, this was a, a, a Hubble image, but Keck did the spectroscopy, announced the most, a new spectroscopic record for most distant galaxy. This one is a redshift of 8.7, amazing. Uh, we've also, in candles, seen the most distant supernova of type 1a. Uh, this was at a redshift of 1.9. Studying more of these distant supernovae will help astronomers better pin down the expansion history of the universe, which will provide more clues about this mysterious dark energy. Uh, the last part of my talk, I want to just talk briefly about the frontier fields. This was an article in the last issue of Sky and Telescope that I edited, the January issue. So what astronomers are doing now is they're doing these deep images where there's foreground clusters that can act as gravitational lenses. And the idea is by using nature's lens, these gravitational lenses, we can see galaxies even further back in time that we normally would not be able to see without the lensing. And they've made some really, uh, you know, this project is just really kind of just getting started. So the big discoveries will come in the years to come. Um, but we're basically trying to figure out what the conditions were like in the early universe and how galaxies have evolved over 13 billion years. And also trying to better understand how the distribution of dark matter has changed over time. Once again, these uh, uh, frontier field pictures are tunnels through time. These are three-dimensional images where the raw objects in red are foreground stars. We have you know, foreground galaxies. The cluster galaxies are the ones doing the lensing. And then you see these more distant galaxies that have been lensed by the foreground galaxies. And astronomers have to sort all this out, which is not easy. But here they discovered a triply lens. This is one galaxy that shows up in three different image locations because it's been gravitationally lensed. And it seems to be, they haven't measured a redshift yet, but based on its colors, they think it's at a redshift of about 9.8, which means we'd be seeing it only 490 million years after the Big Bang, and the galaxy is only 300 light years across. I mean, that's a time, like that's even, that's like the size of a globular cluster, or a big globular cluster, but it's amazing that we can see objects that far back in the universe. Uh, so the next step after Hubble is the, the James Webb Space Telescope. This is scheduled for launch in 2018, but I won't believe it launches until it's actually launched because it's been delayed numerous times although the program seems to be back on track. This is going to be a 6.5 meter telescope. Remember, Hubble's a 2.4 meter. It's also going to be infrared. So it's really optimized to study these very distant high redshift galaxies and tell us about conditions in the early universe. This is a simulated image from the James Webb Space Telescope. And you can see here, this is as far back as ground-based observatories could go in 1990. The 1995 Hubble Deep Field took us back to this redshift. And then we've got the ultra deep field. Uh, then we've got you know, more deep fields. Well, with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, we should be able to get back to redshifts beyond 20, taking us back to really the dawn of when the first stars were forming in the universe. Another thing that James Webb Space Telescope can do is spectra of extrasolar planets. It's even conceivable that the James Webb Space Telescope could do spectra of exoplanets that if you found things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, and water vapor in the atmosphere, 
you would say there's an all likelihood this planet has life. So we might actually, it's conceivable that the James Webb St Space Telescope will discover the first life-bearing planet other than Earth. And beyond Hubble, astronomers would, uh, they've started designing what they're calling the High Definition Space Telescope, uh, which would launch in the 2030s, and that would be like uh, going from a standard definition TV would be analogous to Hubble to an ultra high definition television. Of course, this is all going to depend on Congress and whether Congress is w uh, willing to foot the bill. My guess is if JWST is a big success, then Congress will say yes. If JWST is not a success, then Congress will say no. But hopefully Congress will say yes. So I want to conclude, this is one of my uh, favorite cartoons. This was at, on the door of an astronomer at his office at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And I just think it's really inspiring, you know, what we've learned from Hubble over the last 25 years. You know, it's taught us about things going on in our own solar system and all the way out to telling us about conditions in the very early universe when the first stars and galaxies are starting to form. And I just think as a species, we're much better off, you know, knowing where we are, where we stand in the overall cosmic, you know, uh, you know scheme of things in cosmic history. Uh, so just want to say thank you, Hubble Space Telescope, and all the scientists, engineers, technicians, secretaries, and astronauts who've made it such a big success. Thank you. And since it's, it's not dark out, I guess I should take a couple you questions. Take some questions. Yeah, because it's not dark say, out yet. You make me feel old because I did the math. I started working on Hubble 37 and a half Oh, years wow. Ago. Yeah, because it goes back about 40 years. It, yeah, the yeah. contract was let in 1977. That's right, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for all the work you've done on it. Well, I also left before I started. But you did some work on it, right? You contributed. Thank and you. Guidance, Seriously. Guidance, yeah. Pointing system. Let's see, over here. Um, that's a great question. Now, now, as amateur astronomers in this room, we like to like point our telescopes where there's lots of stuff. Like, you know, you know there's a galaxy there or a cluster or whatever, or a double star. With Hubble, for these deep, not, not the frontier fields where they're looking through lensed areas, but with the Hubble deep field, they were looking for as empty a spot as they could find that have the fewest amount of foreground stars and galaxies that they knew up to that time. They were literally looking for like the most boring patch because they weren't interested in the foreground stuff. They were interested in the very, very distant. So they actually had to look at, you know, do, you know, look at different surveys and everything and say, where is the most boring patch of sky we can find? But even, and you can see in those deep fields, even these boring patches of sky, you're still going to see stuff in the foreground. But I, and I want to mention, too, the frontier fields fields, there they're purposefully looking in the direction where we have these really massive clusters of galaxies in the foreground because they want to take advantage of that gravitational lensing. So with, their, with those fields, they're intentionally you know, looking where they know there's something in the foreground. continuously, yep. as opposed to some other directions where you get blocked by the Earth. So That's true. For, for yep. collection efficiency, they picked it someplace in a direction. That's true. Like the they, thing was, yep. avoid stars. Yeah, that's right. Avoid bright stars, yep. And, and they, they, when they did that uh, observation, in two, I don't remember if it was something like 20 days, 20, 30 days, or something like that, from two, 20, 30 days, yep. at the same point. Yep. And they just build up light. And, and you need to do that because those tiny little blips, they're so faint that you need incredibly long observation to collect enough photons to make those blips even visible. Now, with a larger mirror and also with its infrared, it's more sensitive uh, infrared. See, part of the problem when you're looking at those very high redshift galaxies is the light is emitted in the ultraviolet by the young hot stars. That's where they emit most of their light. 
but the expansion of the universe redshifts that light into the infrared. Okay, so we see that light as infrared light, even though the stars that emitted it were emitted in ultraviolet. So what the James Webb will be able to do is with a bigger mirror and it can see deeper into the infrared, it's going to be able to see those very tiny distant galaxies much more efficiently than Hubble can. I mean, Hubble's able to do it, but kind of just barely. And, it's the, you know, and it can't go all the way back to when the first galaxies formed. James Webb should be able to take us all the way back. You can see that, that illustration I just showed a minute ago. Hubble takes us, you know, with the ultra deep field, it's taking us back to, you know, a redshift of 10, you know, 480 million years after the Big Bang. They think, the theory is that the first stars started to form around 100 to 200 million years after the Big Bang. So Hubble can get us almost all the way back, but not quite. Let's hope that James Webb can do that. Yes? With the Webb, when you're doing that, you're going to have to find even more uh, sparse areas of the sky to look at. Yeah, and, but it, I think it has a narrower, I, I could be wrong on this, I think it has a narrower field of view. So, but I, I, I'm sure, like one of the things they're, they're doing, I'm sure, is figuring out where the best places to go. But you're right, they're going to have, they're not going to, there's certain places they're not going to look because there's too much foreground. Like anything in the plane of the Milky Way galaxy, forget about it, you know, because there's so much foreground contamination. Uh, but there are definitely places where there are kind of holes in the universe where you can see a lot further. It might even look in the same fields as you know, these earlier deep fields. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they do that. So do they have to do a whole sky survey, maybe with the Hubble, to find those? Well, you could never, uh, Hubble's field of, uh, field of view is so small and its observing time is so limited, you could never do a sky survey. Uh, so those surveys more come from like, uh, things like ground-based telescopes. They can only yeah. watch closer stuff. Right, see. right. But they, Right, but they, they can at least show where there's like regions where there are very few foreground stars in the Milky Way. These would be surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or the Two Mass Infrared Survey. They can kind of show you where there's not much foreground in the Milky Way. And certainly we know where a lot of, you know, with all the astronomy that's been done over the last several decades, we know where like a lot of the big foreground clusters are located too. Yes? The chart shows ground-based Yeah. Could you estimate roughly in 2015 the capability of ground-based observatories? Uh, well, the big ones today, uh, like for example, um, let me go back. In Hawaii? Yeah, um, which, okay, right here. So the Keck Observatory was able to measure the redshift of this tiny little dot here. Okay, so, so and that's, you know, at a redshift of 8.68. So with Keck and these 10 meter telescopes, I mean, certainly if it could get this one, it could go a little bit further. So the ground base can probably go back to about a redshift of 10. But basically these extremely high redshift galaxies, you need Hubble above the atmosphere to tell you the targets that you then want to follow up with Keck. And that's one thing I really want to stress is a lot of this is follow up where, okay, so what happens with, with Hubble as you can see, uh, let me go back a second to a good example. Okay, you can see these little blips here from the colors from, and you know, these are diff through different filters based on the, the luminot, the brightness of this object in different filters of Hubble. Remember, this is an image that combines images in several filters you can get an estimate of the redshift. It's, it's called a photometric redshift. Uh, this was a technique developed uh, at Caltech in the 1990s. Now, the photometric redshifts, when you're able to confirm them with Keck, the photometric redshifts have been remarkably accurate, okay? So the astronomers who developed this method they knew what they were doing. They actually were really smart. The lead guy who did this is a guy named Chuck Steidel at Caltech, who's you know, one of the most brilliant astronomers. So you have some of these galaxies then, you can say, okay, um, we can then, we, we think this galaxy 
has an extremely high redshift, like eight and a half. Let's check it with Keck. So with this one, they were actually able to check it and find out that yes, it's extremely high redshift. So for example, this one now, what was the one I said is, might be the record holder? Okay, this galaxy here, uh, based on how it appears in different filters in Hubble, through Hubble different filters, they're estimating a redshift of 9.8, which is astounding. But it'll take an actual measurement from Keck to confirm that. But the fact that you can see it with Hubble, Keck, I think, at least when I read, read about this discovery, this was just a few months ago, Keck should be able to get the spectrum of this object. But you would never even know this object was there <coughs> from a ground-based observation. You'd have to, you have to do the Hubble to resolve it and identify it as an interesting source. You then you follow up with Keck. If you can't see it in the first place with Keck, how can you measure a redshift? Well, what they do is they know the exact coordinates. But it is, it's a very, I mean, believe me. Right, but, and that's the, I don't know exactly how they do that, but they, when, when, whenever they've done this, or most of the time, when they've done these re observations, and remember, Keck is in a pretty good location on Mauna Kea, um, they have found that the red shifts that they measure are generally very close to the estimated red shift. I'm, I'm sure there's been cases where that's not been the case, they but, you know, what's that? They don't talk about those. They don't talk about those. But there's been a number of cases, though, where they've actually been very good. And certainly for lower redshift objects, like in the fives and sixes, though they're usually pretty good, the photometric redshifts. But once again, you know, Hubble doesn't have enough collecting area to measure that redshift. But J JWST will. See, that's the thing, JWST, because it's more sensitive in the infrared than Hubble is, and it has a bigger mirror, JWST will be able to do that spectroscopy. Yes? Can you see further back with optical telescopes or with radar? Um, well, here, here's, here's the oldest light that we see in the universe is the cosmic microwave background. Okay, that's the kind of the afterglow of the Big Bang. Well, we see that now in the microwave part of the spectrum, which is part of radio. That's at a redshift of 1,079. Okay, that light was emitted when the, okay, the, that was visible light at, when the universe was 380,000 years old, and that has been redshifted uh, 1,079, so it's now we see it in the microwave. That's actually much farther back than any of these Hubble pictures or anything JWST will see. So that is the, so we can see far, farthest back in the radio. But that was before, uh, let me try to summarize this. Okay. Yeah, well, um, yeah, because the, 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 the microwave background is actually like the glowing fireball of the Big Bang. To actually see stars, uh, we really would need to do it in infrared, not radio, because the stars aren't emitting un powerfully enough in the radio, and the redshift is so extreme. You wouldn't, I don't think you could see the early generation of stars in radio, because the the stars are emitting most of their energy in the ultraviolet wavelength. Uh, so the ultraviolet is redshifted into infrared. So to see the stars, we have to use infrared to see in terms of discrete, tangible objects. But certainly the oldest light in the universe is the microwave background. But that's not like a single like point object. That's like just the whole, basically the radiation, remnant radiation from the Big Bang. Yes. Could you say some more about this business of the uh, dark matter? Do you expect it not to be coupled to hot gases? Only gravitationally, but it's not. It doesn't interact through like the strong nuclear force or the electromagnetic force, which are much stronger than gravity. Right. Well, what's happening is the two galaxies are kind of plowing through each. The two clusters are plowing through each other. So the dark matter is kind of following the two galaxies as they plow through each other because it's feeling the gravity. But the gas, 
from the two clusters will start, it, it, it interacts with, the gas will interact with the, in the yeah, in the middle. So the gas interacts with itself more than the dark, see so the dark matter particles, it, they don't, based on the hype, the, the theoretical expectation of these, super, these WIMP particles is that the dark matter particles only interact not only through with our type of matter through gravity, but with itself. Although there's some theories that say that if you have two dark matter particles that collide with each other, they'll give off a gamma ray and they're using NASA's Fermi Space Telescope, which is a gamma ray telescope, to see if they can find glowing gamma ray patches from dark matter annihilation. But dark matter basically, it only, it, it, in, in terms of ways that we can see it at least uh, with, with this type of method, you can only see its gravitational effects. That's why we call it dark matter. But you're right, it's, uh, it, it doesn't, you can only see how it's affecting um, the, you know, the light from more distant objects. But you can also measure its effects by, for example, how it was discovered by Vera Rubin in the 70s is how it affects the rotation of spiral galaxies. That's how it was originally discovered. And why Vera Rubin has not won a Nobel Prize in physics, I have no idea why she hasn't won a Nobel. And she's based in Washington, D.C., although she's retired now. If there's anybody who deserves a, a, a Nobel Prize in physics, that's as big a discovery as you get. I don't know why she hasn't won the Nobel Prize in physics. Yes, over here. Great talk, thanks. Yeah. Um, I was wondering what you said about the planet Hubble not being. Mm -hmm. You were pointing out that um, their estimating is about twice the frequency mm -hmm. mass, but it's not really far from the mass. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Do you know how they estimated that mass, twice the frequency mass? Um, the last I talked, the, the astronomer who discovered it, who's at Cal Berkeley, named Paul Kalis, and I asked him, well, how do you get the mass? And the, the basic answer is, well, to, to kind of hold together a cloud that you could see it at that distance from the star, it needs to be like at least a Jupiter mass. It's probably, it's probably they don't really know. That, that is a very, I'm glad you asked. That is a very, very rough estimate, but it, it, it has to be a fairly hefty planet. But, and I, don't, I, don't, I remember you explained to me why they don't think it's like five or 10 Jupiters. There's some reason which I don't remember about why they don't think it's like five or 10 Jupiter masses. They think it's like somewhere between like one and five Jupiter masses, but that mass is not well constrained. And it's a very strange, it's, it's a very strange object because it's sort of a planet, it's behaving like a planet in its orbit, but when they do the analysis of that dot that moves, it's not what you would expect for a planet at that distance in age. It's, I think Fomalhaut was it like 10 or 20 million years old. The planet is like that dot is not what you would expect for a Jupiter mass planet of that age at that distance from the star. And, and for the, after Kalis announced the discovery, I think it was in 2008, a lot of astronomers disputed the finding. Okay, they didn't believe it because they say, well, you have those three epochs, but this planet, you can't possibly be that. So there was actually a lot of skepticism. Kalis took a lot of flack for, and, and you know, the Space Telescope Science Institute and NASA announced the discovery and they took a lot of flack for it. Okay, but then the later observations, they continued to see that dot move at exactly the rate you would expect if it's an orbiting planet. But the nature of that planet, at least last I was reading about it, it it's, it's a very mysterious object. And it's interesting, because just a, a day or two ago, they imaged another young Jupiter-mass planet in orbit around a more distant star, that one is more along the lines of like what you would expect theoretically, uh, but that one seems to be closer into the star. But that Fomalhaut B is a weird object. It's not well understood. At least last I checked the literature. It's moving too slow or too fast? Well, the, the movement's what you expect. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, ener it's brightness in different filters is very strange. Like, you, you, for example, when Jupiter formed, it started off very hot and then it cools off over time, and you can kind of model what Jupiter would be like 
when it's the age of this Fomalhaut B. Okay, and we've imaged now several other planets around other stars that are roughly the same age at the same age and same mass as Fomalhaut B, those other planets more or less conform to what we would expect Jupiter to look like when it was a few tens of millions of years old. Fomalhaut B, like the, 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 the dot is too bright, but the energy distribution is too cold, like it's a colder object than what you would expect for Jupiter of that uh, at that distance from the star in that age. So the, so the theory is it's surrounded by this kind of cloud of dust that makes it look larger and cooler than you would expect a planet of that age. But because it looks so weird and so contrary to expectation, that led astronomers for several years to really doubt that it even existed. But once again, it shows nature's right. You, you know, just because something shouldn't exist if we find it, nature is always more clever than we are. Follow yep. up on that, you also, one thing to remember is that the orbit of the object, generally speaking, doesn't depend on the object, mm. it depends only on the star. Of yep. the so the orbit doesn't tell you anything whatsoever about the object, it only tells you what it is, that's it. So, you know, it's, the orbit is not different from what you would expect there, no matter the characteristics of the planet. Yep. The one, one other thing I should mention, I, maybe I could go back to the picture, but you might remember the object was right inside that ring. Okay, when they found that ring, they saw the ring before they noticed there was a planet there. They're like, well, why do you have a ring there with a sharp edge? Okay, and the immediate idea is there's a planet on the inside of that ring that's kind of shepherding and sculpting that ring. So in that sense, when the planet was announced by Paul Kalis, the planet was right where you would expect a planet to be. Right inside, in fact, let me, hold on, let me go back to that, go back to that picture. I probably could do this, find a faster way to do this. We're getting there. There we go. So you can see it, it's right inside this ring. And this ring, by the way, is think of it like the Kuiper belt in our solar system. It's this, it's probably there's small comets and planetesimals in this ring that are colliding with each other and generating dust. Now this ring is farther out from the star than the Kuiper belt is in our solar system. This is a Fomalhaut, I don't remember the exact mass, but it's more massive than the sun. But this is probably what the Kuiper belt looked like four and a half built, like a few tens of millions of years after the sun and the solar system formed. The Kuiper belt was probably this debris belt. <coughs> um, um, it, I mean, think of this as kind of a, a, zod a zodiacal light on steroids. But eventually, you know, this stuff gets cleared out by the wind of the star, but also through, you know, just gravity, like this stuff collides and just gets eventually disperses. So you see these debris disks, I think I showed like these are all the same thing. These are debris disks around these young stars. Uh, but in the case here, uh, whoops, uh, Fomalhaut B, what's its distance? I think it's only like 26 light years away. Fomalhaut's one of the closest stars in the sky. So it's close enough that you can actually see this, this planet here. But once again, this planet is really weird and is not what was expected of a planet of the age of this star and this distance from the star. I'm pretty sure about the picture, I was never clear that the black circle in the middle, that's been obscured? Yes, uh, this is a corona, I'm sorry, I should have explained this. This is from a coronagraph that they have that can block out the light of the star. Okay, because Fomalhaut's an extremely bright star, so you need to block out the light of the star itself to see this faint structure. I, I should also mention there's a very high likelihood, and I, I would bet money on this, there are more planets in this system that are well inside, but we can't see them because they're so close to the star. The star will block, you know, block, you know, totally obliterates the light of the planet. The only planet we would have a hope of seeing 
is one that it's at a very far distance from the star. But the fact that we've got this fairly massive planet at a large distance from the star tells you planet formation has gone on here. There's you know, a lot of mass there. I, you know, there's almost certainly more planets orbiting that star. Might take a while to find them and discover them. But uh, there's, you know, when I talked to Kalis about this several years ago, he said he'd bet a lot of money there's additional planets there, including possible smaller planets, you know, roughly analogous to Earth that are maybe much closer in. I should just mention that maybe this is a little bit off topic. Um, my favorite images of a planetary system, there's a star called HR8799. Okay, well, infrared pictures taken with ground-based telescopes have found four planets, okay? The planets start out at about Jup Uranus or Jupiter's distance and go way out to a little bit beyond like Pluto's distance. What's really strange there, and they've actually seen, it's interesting, the system is face on. So the four planets are orbiting like from our point of view, like a circle because the system's almost face on to our line of sight. Okay, based on the, uh, the infrared luminosity of those four planets and the, the age of the star, which is a few tens of millions of years old, those planets are all estimated to have roughly like seven to ten times the mass of Jupiter. Okay, so think about that. This is a star with four extremely massive planets. It's got like 40, 40 Jupiter masses in planets. Okay, like the solar system, we have like Jupiter and Saturn's like not even a third the mass of Jupiter. So the solar system has like 1.4 Jupiter masses bound up in planets. This system has like 40 Jupiter, at least we, there could be other planets we haven't seen yet. 40 Jupiter masses bound up in, in four planets. That, that's like, it's amazing. But those planets are very real. They've followed them now for like seven or eight years now. They see the orbital motion. They're fairly bright infrared sources, which means they're hot, which means they have to be fairly massive. They haven't cooled off yet. Some of them, they've even got spectroscopy, so they know a little bit about the conditions in the atmosphere. That's my favorite system, because it's really, really weird. I mean, it's really hard from a theoretical point of view uh, you know, to form a planetary system with that much mass in planets. Because when you look at, remember I showed those disks in the Orion Nebula? Those, those disks, which will for, those haven't formed planets yet or are just starting to form planets, you know, there's only like enough mass in those disks to maybe form like maybe one or two planets, that, you know, that are roughly the mass of Jupiter. So this HR8799 system, you can go on the web and look at pictures, the, the images of the planets. That is like wild. Yeah. So 99 is not correspondingly massive? What's that? This star. That star is not uh, it, it is. It's an, here's the thing. It's an, I think it's an A star. So it's more massive than the sun, but not a lot. It's like just several times more. It's similar to Fomalhaut B in mass. It's like, I think it's like two to five times the mass of the sun. So it is a more massive star, but it's not a lot more massive. Here, oh, here's another thing. Okay, Kepler. Okay, I didn't talk that much about, I didn't talk about Kepler, but Kepler has found planetary systems that have five or six planets that are roughly the mass of Earth to several times the mass of Earth within about 1.5 AU of the host stars. Okay, imagine that where you have like five or six planets that are like Earth mass or even more massive than Earth, like super Earths, crammed into a region smaller than the orbit of Mars. Okay, that is totally wild. So to me, you know, I mentioned the two biggest discoveries of the last 20 years are exoplanets and the expanding universe, or accelerating universe. The lesson from exoplanets, and I wrote a lot of, and edited a lot of articles about exoplanets at Sky and Telescope, is that the theories that existed prior to the discoveries of exo, extrasolar planets that existed prior to 1995 all of them pretty much spit out, when they did these computer models, 
cookie cutter solar systems where you have little itty bitty planets close in and big Jupiter mass planets farther out. Well, the very first exoplanet found around a normal star was a Jupiter mass planet at 0.05 AU. Okay, so the very first planet completely demolished all of that work that had gone on. And what we now know is that these planetary systems take an incredible variety of architectures. And it does not appear, by the way, that our solar system is even a typical system. Like most systems are really, from our point of view of the solar system, most systems are really, really weird. And, and there's, and I mean, the one thing too that Jeff Marcy has told me, there is no such thing as a typical planetary system. They take, you've got some with the big planets close in, some far out, some mixed in, where you've got like a mixture of close in big planets and little planets. Another thing too is that the most common type of planet in the, solar, in the, in the Milky Way galaxy are planets that are intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune. You know, so think about that. They Kepler has found huge numbers of those planets, okay? And, and yet it can, Kepler has an easier time finding bigger planets, but it's not finding that many bigger planets, and it can find planets all the way down to the size of, of Mars. But it hasn't found many of those either, but it's found scads and scads of these super Earths. So the really amazing thing is that the most common size planet in the Milky Way galaxy is not represented in the solar system. Which I think is that that is really bizarre. But when you think about it, like why shouldn't there be planets intermediate in size between Earth and Neptune? Well, it turns out there's a lot of planets. There's, there's billions of those planets in the Milky Way. There just doesn't happen to be any in our, in our, in our solar system. We can also say too from Kepler's statistics now that there is at least 100 billion planets in our galaxy. At least 100 billion. Probably many hundreds of billions of planets. What we don't know, of course, is the $64,000 question, how many of them have life? I, if I had to bet money, and don't make me bet money, I would bet that there's at least one billion planets in the Milky Way galaxy that at least have some form of primitive life. Because you can also include moons, like we might have some of the moons of the outer solar system you know, that have liquid water, might have some kind of primitive life. So if you start including moons, there's, there's got to be huge numbers of worlds out there with some kind of life. Intelligent life, I'm much more skeptical, but that's my prediction. But don't hold me to it, I could be totally wrong. Yep, yeah, we should, it's getting dark, yep. Yep, yeah, thank you, thank you all, yep. <laughs>